our host, Michael Bannock, with whip in hand, is on a quest to discover the saints through the centuries. He painstakingly searches high and low, but where could they be? Surely man's system of government will help our studious host find the answers. Oftentimes, clues can be found right under our nose. Rather expeditiously, he realizes that man's conspiracies are a door that is better left unopened. Michael, in desperation, consulted some of the locals. Sadly, this was not as advantageous as he would have hoped. Perhaps the institutions of higher learning hold the key to unearthing these secrets. Quickly, he finds himself entrenched in the annals of history. Astonishingly, Bannock finds direction in the most unlikely of places. Has he done it? Could it be this obvious? Ah, sadly, man's machinations run deeper than once thought. Will he ever find the truth? Join our fedora-wearing host, Michael Midwest Bannock, on his search to find the true believers on this explosive episode of The Saints Through the Centuries. Shalom, I'm Brother Michael Bannock, your host for this special five-part series in which we discover the saints through the centuries. In this installment, we will search for the true Seventh-day Sabbath keepers through history. Fasten your seatbelts, there will be a lot here. And you will likely want to take notes or else pause the video to capture key references along the way. Our material today comes in three parts. We will show, number one, all believers in all ages observe the Sabbath of some kind. Number two, there is universal agreement among all sources that the true Seventh-day Sabbath was observed by the apostles and the earliest messianics, even during the time when Rome seized control of mainstream Christianity. Number three, while Roman-derived Christianity drifted into a Sunday tradition, True Seventh-day Sabbath keepers maintained the original observance through the last 2,000 years. Finding true Seventh-day Sabbath keepers in history has proven to be easy. Once you get started in this search, the sheer volume of data is striking. Before we get to that, we must clear the air on something basic. It is common for today's hip modern go-go Christian to claim that there is no Sabbath. That's all done away with, they say. Well-meaning but misinformed, they will point to Romans 14.5, Colossians 2.16, and Galatians 4.10 as verification of the Sabbath's demise. Yet it can be shown that with virtually no exceptions, all Christians of all eras, all places and all denominations kept a Sabbath of some kind through history. How can this be? They had the same Pauline scriptures to inform them, Yet they never interpreted Paul's letters to mean that Sabbath was ended. Indeed, the no Sabbath crowd has some explaining to do. Here is a look at some of the players through history which received the Sabbath command even though they had the day wrong. We start with Charles Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers. He upheld the Sabbath. Here we see a sermon he gave May 24, 1857, entitled Heavenly Rest. He even loads by quoting Hebrews 4.9. There remains a rest to the people of the Almighty. There's John Wesley who set England ablaze with light. He taught the Sabbath. I quote his opening remark from his sermon on the subject. He's in turn quoting critics of the Sabbath. Quote, That the Sabbath was not ordained in the beginning of the world, nor ever observed from the creation till the time of Moses, that being given by Moses to the Jews 
it was not observed as a moral precept. But like other ceremonies, it was something kept sometimes and sometimes not, as public or private business gave way. That lastly, it was forever repealed at the destruction of the temple. End of quote. And thus, John Wesley proceeds with a great sermon in support of the Sabbath. Many of you have heard of the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. The celebrated founder, Dwight Moody, explained how to best keep the Sabbath as follows. In a sermon entitled, How Shall We Spend the Sabbath? This is a serious question for young and old, he writes. When I was a boy, the Sabbath lasted from sundown on Saturday to sundown on Sunday. And I remember how we boys used to shout when the Sabbath was over. It was the worst day of the week to us. I believe it can be made the brightest day in the week. Every child ought to be reared so that he shall be able to say with a friend that he would rather have the other six days weeded out of his memory than the Sabbath of his childhood. Let's press on to Charles Finney. One of the great reformers in recent time was Charles Finney. He was no slouch as it came to the Sabbath. Charles Finney taught the Sabbath, and here we see a theological lecture devoted to it. And I uh, highlight there the fourth commandment, as he calls it. When you get a chance, I'd like you to download a copy of John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. Go to the section where he is having a dialogue with a character named Hope. And there you will find one of the sins that Hope repents of is Sabbath breaking. John Bunyan knew about the Sabbath. In the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith, it has a nice meaty section on Sabbath keeping. Eight paragraphs on religious worship and the Sabbath day. And here we only see three of those paragraphs in the uh, section on your screen there. There's more. The Catholic Church brags that they change the day of the Sabbath, and they even attempt to call Protestants home to them on that basis. To this day, many Catholics treat Sunday with a reverence and quiet, as though it was the real Sabbath. Here we have a quote from Stephen Keenan, a Catholic priest, in a book called Doctrinal Catechism. He says, If Scripture were their only rule, wash the feet of one another according to the command of Christ, in the 13th chapter of St. John, they should keep not the Sunday, but the Saturday, according to the commandment. Remember thou, keep holy the Sabbath day. For this commandment has not in Scripture been changed or abrogated. So here this Catholic priest admits a number of things. The Sabbath still stands, it was changed to Sunday, and the Protestants are obeying the Catholic Church in doing that change. He goes on in that book, Have you any other way of proving, question, that the Church has power to institute festivals of precept? And he answers, Had she not such power, she could not have done that, in which all modern religionists agree with her. She could not have substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day, a change for which there is no scriptural authority. We're building a cloud of witnesses that everybody knew about a Sabbath of some kind or another. In modern times, the Billy Graham Association still posts a reminder on their webpage about the Sabbath. I remember reading this article written by Billy Graham many years ago. We also have a noted evangelist, Alistair Begg, continuing to teach the Sabbath from his pulpit. We also have a modern Academy Award-winning film verifying that the Sabbath principle was known in modern times. The film was called Chariots of Fire and even adapted to a stage play. In this true story, a dedicated British missionary boy, Eric Liddell, competes successfully at the Olympics after refusing to participate in a qualifying run on, quote, the Lord's Day. And here's another one for you movie buffs. In Alfred Hitchcock's early masterpiece, The 39 Steps, the protagonist is chased by both the assassins 
and by the police through central England. And he nearly loses his life at a Sunday gathering. When he reports it to the police in London, the constable says, It's a lesson to us all, Mr. Hannay, not to mix with doubtful company on the Sabbath. And this was in 1935. And that's pretty recent. The understanding of the Sabbath as a command is so well known that it would be high-handed folly to deny its truth. Somehow Christians through history never interpreted Paul's writings as a rejection of Sabbath. They simply drifted into the wrong day of the week, like our good friend here, Jonathan Edwards, who tried to push this idea of changing it to Sunday. Question, how could they get it so wrong? As we will demonstrate shortly, we have a counterfeit on our hands. After this break, we will demonstrate from ancient authorities that the Seventh-day Sabbath was the norm for all saints. I call this phenomenon the evolution of the devil. Over time, the evil one substitutes a fake. Then he destroys even the counterfeit. And finally, any attempts at reform will at most return to a counterfeit. After the following announcements, we'll return and trace the historical pressures brought to bear against the true Seventh-day Sabbath. Have you ever wondered why holidays like Easter and Christmas are not found in the Bible? Even more perplexing is the fact that we find special days, like the Passover and Pentecost, being observed in both Old and New Testaments. The fact is, Easter, Christmas, and many of today's popular holidays are not based on Scripture, but evolved from man's secular traditions going back thousands of years before the Savior. Knowing that these days developed from confusion of worship, should we observe them today? And more importantly, why would we not honor the days that our Father appointed in His Word? The holy days that Yahweh established are just as relevant today as they were in Scripture. They are commanded by our Father in Heaven in the Old Testament, observed by the Messiah and His Apostles in the New Testament, and will be established once more in His Kingdom. If you desire to honor the one you worship, we invite you to learn more about the all-important feasts through our free booklet, The Amazing Biblical Feasts. In this eye-opening booklet, we explain why these commanded days are important and how they are to be observed today. And we provide in-depth biblical evidence why these days are required for New Testament believers. As a bonus, we would also like to send you our booklet entitled Easter, The Fertility of It All, Request your free booklets now and start your journey towards the keeping of Yahweh's holy days. Welcome back to Sabbath Keepers Through the Centuries. In our previous segment, we showed that all believers in all ages accepted and honored a Sabbath of some kind. While many had drifted to the wrong day, only today's Christian is blinded to this reality, thanks to materialism and commercialism. Before we illustrate the observance of the true Sabbath in history, it is proper that we acknowledge the pressures brought to bear against the Sabbath in history. We call this segment the Sabbath under attack. By focusing on key developments early in the Messianic movement, we can see the stage set for mischief and corruption when the Roman Church finally emerged. I now present to you five pressure points on the Sabbath, and this is number one. Jerusalem loses its influence. Jerusalem enjoyed a leadership position amongst the earliest believers. Paul gained endorsement from Jerusalem after his conversion. In Romans 15, 27, Paul declares the Gentile saints to be debtors to Jerusalem. And historical tradition acknowledges that missionaries were sent out from Jerusalem. This is our starting point. Jerusalem had the lead. Next point. At the earliest time, as recorded in the Bible, all saints observed the Sabbath. The Gentile disciples, far from Jerusalem, were expected by the Jerusalem council to go to the synagogue on Sabbath and hear the law taught to them 
to verify this expectation, let's see Acts 15, verse 20 to 21. But that we write unto them, it says, that they abstain from pollution of idols, and from fornication, and from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Here's the next point. The assembly at Jerusalem had James, a kinsman of Yahshua, as the local overseer or bishop, while Peter coordinated outreach amongst the Jews. Through Paul, and later apostles sent abroad, Jerusalem held leading influence over the worldwide assemblies. Furthermore, it was commonly understood by early Christians that the destruction of Jerusalem was a divine punishment triggered when James was martyred somewhere between 62 AD and 69 AD. For this you can see Eusebius's history, chapter 18, The Martyrdom of James. Now according to Eusebius, the second bishop of Jerusalem was Simeon of Jerusalem. It was he who later led the Jewish disciples, the Nazarenes, out of Jerusalem before the fall of the city in 70 AD. Now, under this Simeon, Messianic Nazarenes took flight to Pella for safety, but also returned after the war quieted down. And here we quote from Epiphanius. So Aquila, while he was in Jerusalem, also saw the disciples of the disciples of the apostles flourishing in the faith and working great signs, healings, and other miracles. For they were such as had come back from the city of Pella to Jerusalem and were living there and teaching. This is from Epiphanius on Weights and Measures, section 15. But even after their return to Jerusalem, their leadership position was lost. Note that later Christians in the Western Roman world considered these original remnant believers, the Nazarenes, to be heretics. We quote from Epiphanius from his writing the Panarion. Quote, this heresy of the Nazareans exists in Beria, in the neighborhood of Coeli, Syria, and the Decapolis in the region of Pella, and in Basanitis in the so-called Kokokba. From there it took its beginning after the exodus from Jerusalem when all the disciples went to live in Pella, because Messiah had told them to leave Jerusalem and to go away since it would undergo a siege. Because of this advice, they lived in Peria after having moved to that place, as I said. Let me summarize pressure point number one on the Sabbath. By the time of 100 AD, the Jerusalem assembly still existed, but had lost its influence. And as we will see, most of the centralized influence moved to Rome. Now we come to pressure point number two. Rome emerges as a center of Christian leadership. First point, the early Messianic faith got a good start in Rome. And this is evidenced by a prominent epistle from Paul to the Romans and Paul's migration to Rome as documented toward the book of Acts. Furthermore, early church fathers attest that Peter also migrated to Rome. With him being an authentic Jew, this is good influence. Additionally, according to the Jewish Encyclopedia, there was a significant Jewish community in Rome. At first, this became a hearty source from which to convert new Messianic believers. So now I summarize pressure point number two. Rome has emerged as a center of Christian leadership. In the beginning, Jerusalem and then Rome enjoyed thriving Messianic communities under the direction of authentic Jewish leadership. This becomes important when that leadership vanishes. The Sabbath under attack, pressure point number three. The Jewish leadership in Rome is obliterated and replaced with Gentiles. First of all, historically, Jews had swayed between favor under Rome and persecution by Rome. Second point, Acts 18.2 
documents a time when Jews were expelled from Rome by order of Emperor Claudius. Historically, this has been narrowed to occur somewhere between 41 AD and 53 AD. Note in Acts that Priscilla and Aquila meet Paul while they were exiled. Now this exile was temporary, as seen by the later greeting to Priscilla and Aquila, who are now back in Rome, and you'll see this in Romans 16.3. But this exile created a time frame of about six years in which Gentile believers were congregating without Messianic Jewish fellowship. Thus, new traditions of congregational fellowship and devotional practice were free to emerge. The new conditions experienced by returning Messianic Jews, returning to Rome, is exemplified by the fact that Priscilla and Aquila are seen holding services in their own home. And you'll see this in Romans 16, verse 3 to 5. It says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in the Messiah, Yahshua, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the assemblies of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the assembly that is in their house. Furthermore, Rome's growing persecution of believers made conversion for Jews even less attractive. Now, Linus, an Italian, was made bishop of Rome in 67 AD. And reportedly, he was ordained by Peter and Paul before their martyrdom. Note, from this point forward, every bishop of Rome will be a Gentile. Even more, the apostolic leadership was dying off as we approach 70 AD. Whatever apostles we had abiding in Rome, they surely died off, and their Jewish disciples were aging or never returned after the Claudian exile. So let's summarize pressure point number three. Rome experienced a profound loss of leadership, especially after the last Jewish leaders died off. Now we come to pressure point number four, with the Sabbath under attack. As of 70 AD, Gentile Messianics in the Roman Empire were motivated to shun Judaism. First of all, the monotheism of Judaism was disdained by the Romans. They believed in worshiping many deities. Now to outsiders, Christianity seemed to offer a religion with a second deity. Meanwhile, the Jewish revolt in Jerusalem in 70 AD left a bad mark on all Jews, as we will see. After the destruction of the temple, Jews throughout the empire were required to pay a tax to rebuild pagan shrines in what was formerly Judea. This included those who were practicing messianics. If a Jew could show that he was not a practicing Jew, he could avoid the tax. Gentile messianics were roped in with practicing Jews because they continued in the original devotional framework of the Bible. From 70 AD to 100 AD, new traditions emerged for the Roman version of the faith, while signs of the original faith suffered a gradual erosion. So now we summarize pressure point number four against the Sabbath. As of 70 AD, Roman Christianity gradually pulled away from the Hebrew roots of the faith, being increasingly disconnected from their distant Jewish brethren. Finally, pressure point number five for the Sabbath under attack. Roman citizens, including Gentile converts, were under the increasing influence of sun worship. First of all, sun worship was prominent in the Roman Empire. Here we draw upon the book, The Cult of Sol Invictus, by Gaston H. Halsbergi published in 1972. He says, It can only be concluded that the Romans worshipped and prayed to Sol, the sun, as one of their de indigitius, that is, native deities. It is important in this connection to consider the meaning and importance of the indigitis. There is no difficulty in placing the worship of the sun god in the earliest times when it solely took on a natural pattern and form determined by observation of the solar cycle. Although it is the sun chariot and the solar disk that are most often found on rocks and caves, 
The first traces of a human-like representation of the sun deity have also been found there. In Rome itself, we find indications of a cultic worship of Sol Indiges, as early as the time of the oldest calendar, in which the close relationship between Jupiter and Sol is clear. When mention is made of Sol Indiges, a sun god is meant who was worshipped in Rome as early as the 4th century BC. And also from page 36 of Halsbergi's book, in the 2nd century AD, that is 100 AD and beyond, the eastern sun gods occupied an unchallenged position. Their great power is significantly and officially expressed in the name Sol Invictus, that is, sun unconquerable. Now let us remember that the Gentile converts of Rome were reared in the pagan schools of philosophy popular at that time. They're already products of their culture, just like we are. Their culture just happened to be very pagan. Next, in the second century, there arose a practice among Christians to briefly gather at sunrise on Sunday mornings, sing and pray, and then go about their affairs. This short gathering was a precursor to the Lord's Day. Now, the earliest undisputed report of Lord's Day worship is in the apocryphal gospel of Peter from around 150 AD. Around 150 AD, Justin Martyr states that, quote, we all gather on the day of the sun. Unexplainably, Roman Christians continued Seventh-day Sabbath observance while adding a Lord's Day morning gathering to their practices. To this hour, scholars and theologians cannot seem to pinpoint when this Sunday gathering was started. It's not in the Bible. It simply emerged in a European sun-worshipping environment. So, to summarize pressure point number five, the symbolism and practices of sun worship began affecting Gentile believers from 100 AD onward. Now to review, these five factors led to the gradual emergence of pagan thought and symbolism in the Gentile church, now headquartered at Rome. Number one, Jerusalem lost its influence after 70 AD. Number two, Rome emerged as an alternate center of religious leadership. Number three, Rome experienced a profound loss of Jewish leadership, especially after the last Jewish leaders died off. Number four, as of 70 AD, Gentile messianics in the empire were motivated to shun Judaism. And number five, under these conditions and the increasing cultural influence of sun worship, Gentile converts continued Sabbath observance while adopting a Sunday morning Lord's Day. Despite all these pressures, Sabbath keeping still survived through the ages. It survived through the early Roman era. It survived through the Dark Ages. It survives today. After the following break, we'll return and discover the avalanche of data available, showing continuing observance of the true Seventh-day Sabbath through the centuries. Hoi ha'omarim l'ra tov wela tov ra to those who call Samin evil good and chose who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter.
has been said, the truth is oftentimes stranger than fiction. Visit our website, yrm.org. Download our mobile app for Apple or Android. Simply search YRM. We at YRM believe in open communication and in bringing people together. A call just came through from a screaming man insisting that Sabbath was done away with. We had to put him on hold when a second call came through, a raving woman insisting that Sabbath was changed to Sunday. We decided to patch them together and let them figure out for themselves which distortion they would urge upon us. But for we who love the truth, let's return to our broadcast. Welcome back for segment three, of Sabbath Keepers through history. In our previous segment, we explained the cultural and historical forces which created pressure against authentic Sabbath keeping. In this segment, we will show the resilient, universal observance of Sabbath in the apostolic era and for hundreds of years thereafter. We named this segment, What the Authorities Say. Most Christians will agree that the earliest Messianic believers were Jews, and thus kept the Sabbath. But what evidence do we have that Gentile converts kept the Sabbath? We have a ton of verification that Gentile converts kept the Sabbath, so much that we struggle to squeeze it all in. What we'll do in this final segment is provide focused data points from the saints through the centuries and give you the tools for researching these things further for yourself. Question. How could you verify that Seventh-day Sabbath observance was going on all the time, from the Apostles' time going forward? Really now, how would you demonstrate such a thing? We will verify these facts with citations from ancient historical documents, writings of so-called Church Fathers, and observations of recognized scholars. But first this. We wish, we wish to remind our viewers that these statements from antiquity were made with full knowledge of Paul's writings. All of those things of Paul, which are misquoted, cited out of context, distorted, they had no impact on the universal practice of the Sabbath. It will be evident that those who cite Paul as anti-Sabbath are misinterpreting the great apostle to the Gentiles. Our first citations come from an ancient document called the Didache. The Didache is a summary of best practices for Christians roughly around 100 AD, a time in which the Roman Church was gaining ascendancy. Here are some facts about the Didache. The Didache is widely considered a composite work, with sections added and modified as deemed necessary. Internally to the document itself, it was claimed to be a statement of the Apostles' Doctrine, and thus it is often called the Doctrine of the Apostles. While the Didache is not considered to be inspired, it is recognized as a good snapshot of Christian practices, with its oldest content assigned to a date between the late 1st century and 2nd century. Here is a curious fact from the Didache. In the Didache, the days of the week are usually given numbers. Now consider this entry. In chapter 8, in the section on fasting, we see the following instructions. Let not your fasts be with the hypocrites, for they fast on the second and fifth day of the week. But you shall fast on the fourth day and the preparation day, which is Friday. The Greek word there for Friday really is preparation day. Normally it would be called the sixth day, but in this document it is called preparation day. Think about it. This only makes sense if they are keeping a Sabbath on the following day. That little morsel is only the beginning. We next turn to a treatise called the Constitutions of the Holy Apostles. Often called the Apostolic Constitutions, this massive work has been dated to about 375 AD. If we use it strictly as a snapshot of beliefs and practices of that time, the Seventh-day Sabbath keeping clearly jumps out of the pages. In paragraph 36, it says, Thou shalt observe the Sabbath on account of him who ceased from his work of creation, but ceased not from his work of providence. 
It is a rest for the meditation of the law, not for idleness of the hands. End of quote. In this document from the 4th century, we have European Christians promoting the original Sabbath. In paragraph 19 it says, But assemble yourselves together every day, morning and evening, singing psalms and praying in Yahweh's house, in the morning saying the 62nd Psalm, and in the evening the 140th, but principally on the Sabbath day. It is striking that this same 4th century document also mentions the practice of gathering on, quote, the Lord's Day, a novel practice we explained earlier. And the Lord's Day is described as separate from the Sabbath in this document. In paragraph 19, showing evidence of the original Sabbath, it mentions Preparation Day just like the Didache. Quote, We enjoin you to fast every fourth day of the week and every day of the preparation, and the surplusage of your fast bestow on the needy. From this 4th century European document, we verify at once that the Seventh-day Sabbath was still in observance. Seventh-day Sabbath keeping can be seen through the last 2,000 years in massive compilations performed by Seventh-day Sabbatarians who keep republishing the information, yes, for our benefit. From these resources, we find that the Seventh-day Sabbath was upheld by ancient assemblies in China the Nestorian Christians, the Ethiopian Church, Churches of the East, the St. Thomas Christians of Malabar, India, and the Celtic Church of Britain. These resources have been on the internet for decades. These compilations later turned up under various online ministries, and it continues to be captured and republished by others. Here are a variety of the links featuring nearly identical content. No, I won't be reading these web links, but you can pause the video and copy them for yourself. Please take a look at these. We will be sharing excerpts from this resource, but first here's a capture of the table of contents from one of them. As can be seen, researchers who clean before us show that the Sabbath has been upheld through every century. To get started, we focused on early historical data, even though all centuries have evidence of Sabbath keeping. We have captured the references, and for selected references, we located the original source material. For our first example, in reference to second century believers, this quote comes from the Dialogues on the Lord's Day, page 189, published in London, 1701, by Dr. T. H. Maurer a Church of England divine. He writes, The primitive Christians had a great veneration for the Sabbath and spent the day in devotion and sermons. It is not to be doubted, but they derived this practice from the apostles themselves, as appears by several scriptures to that purpose. We found the old book scanned here at this web page, the link's there on, uh, on your screen, and the citation looks like this. We must yield, therefore, that the primitive Christians had a great veneration for the Sabbath and spent the day in devotion and in sermons. And tis not to be doubted, but they derived this practice from the apostles themselves, as appears by several scriptures to that purpose. So whoever lifted this and quoted it in recent publications, they did a pretty good job of capturing this old writing from long ago. We'll be giving you a few more examples of that. Here is another observation from a noted source, Theodore von Zahn. He writes, The Sabbath was a strong tie which united them with the life of the whole people. And in keeping the Sabbath holy, they followed not only the example, but also the command of Yahshua. And this is from a book, uh, it's got a German name, Geschichte des Sonntags. Now, to verify the quote, it's from page 13 and 14 from this book published in 1878. We located the book, and here is the German from which our English translation is taken. And yes, I checked. The English we have is a good interpretation of the German there. And here, 
Uh, next, we have the conclusions of a researcher named Johann Karl Ludwig Geisler. The Gentile Christians observed also the Sabbath, he writes. And once again, we, we scan it and we paste up here for you, you know, direct verifying that these references uh, have value. This comes from Geisler's Church History, from 1880, Volume 1, Chapter 2, Paragraph 30, Page 93. Here, scholar Jeremy Taylor shares his observation. Quote, The primitive Christians did keep the Sabbath of the Jews, therefore the Christians for a long time together did keep their conventions upon the Sabbath, in which some portions of the law were read, and this continued till the time of the Laodicean Council. This comes from the whole works of Jeremy Taylor, volume 9, page 416, and under Hebrews edition, published in 1822. Again, we located the original book, and the pertinent section is presented here. So these references really do exist. We're not pulling them out of thin air. Pressing on from John Lay, an English clergyman and member of the Westminster Assembly, we have this confession. Quote, from the Apostles' time until the Council of Laodicea, which was about the year 364, the holy observance of the Jew Sabbath continued, as may be proved out of many authors, yea, notwithstanding the decree of the Council against it. This comes from a book called Sunday a Sabbath by John Lay, page 163, published in London, 1640. And for all of these, we give you links on how you could find this on the internet for yourself. In this image from the original work, we see him acknowledging reverence of the Sabbath in addition to the quote above. From the foregoing, it appears that the Council of Laodicea forbade authentic seventh-day Sabbath keeping. Despite the Council of Laodicea, countless believers resisted the influence of Rome and continued in the true seventh-day observance. Now let's jump ahead in history. In a remarkable book by Leslie Hardinge, we learn that the two great evangelists to Ireland, Patrick and Columba, were Seventh-day Sabbatarians. That's right, good old St. Patrick kept the Sabbath. This was in the 5th and 6th centuries. Here we see two editions of the work, the Celtic Church in Britain. A useful treatise from the 1800s is available online for download at archive.org. It's called A General History of the Sabbatarian Churches by Tamar Davis, published in 1851. The author describes several historical Sabbatarian assemblies, including the Armenian Assembly from the first century forward, ancient assemblies of India from the Apostle Thomas going forward. He, by the way, also evangelized China, the ancient Ethiopic assemblies the Transylvania Christians from around 1500, Sabbatarian assemblies in Russia discovered in 1824, the Sabbatarian Anabaptists of Holland in the 1500s, the most ancient Nestorians, and the Sabbatarians of England and America who continue to this day. We could go on and on like this, but the enterprise would be exhausting. Let us recommend some further resources which you can access. We wish to recommend that everyone access the free online book published by a friend of this ministry, Elder Don Esposito, from the Congregation of Yahweh Jerusalem. His book is entitled, The Gates of Hell Will Not Prevail Against Her, published in 2014. This treatise covers additional historical saints who kept the true Sabbath through the centuries. As a key recommendation, we suggest an excellent 11-part documentary still available on YouTube. It's called The Seventh Day. Smartly hosted by Hal Holbrook, this documentary brings to life even more amazing facts, such as the persecuted 14th century Subotniks of Russia and obscure Sabbath keepers found all around the world. For serious researchers, we recommend to you the granddaddy of books explaining how the original Sabbath was changed by the Roman Church into Sunday. It's titled From Sabbath to Sunday by Samuel Bakiaki. Finally, for a clear statement of the importance of the Sabbath for Yahweh's people, we strongly suggest our own concise study booklets 
available free online or by contacting our office. For those who are still struggling to justify keeping the original Seventh-day Sabbath, we offer this book, Sabbath Keeping, Answering the Arguments. And for those wishing to contemplate a life application approach to the Sabbath, we offer the booklet, How to Honor the Sabbath Day. Here's a summary of the findings we have shared with you. Number one, all believers of all ages honored a Sabbath of some kind. Number two, the change to Sunday was centered in Roman Christendom. Number three, if your assembly operated outside Roman influence, your ancient assembly continued to honor the seventh day. Number four, countless assemblies worldwide have been found to verify this. Number five, Though we have focused on simply finding verification of Sabbath keepers through the centuries, your own research can go deeper with the resources we have shared with you. Number six, the verification of true Sabbath keeping is overwhelming in scope, and we hope the sampling we have given you is enough to send you on a lifetime of discovery. Let us please remember, the Sabbath is a sign of Yahweh's people. In Exodus 31.13 it is written, Verily my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations. We at YRM are enormously grateful that you joined us. Thanks for watching, and Yahweh be with you. Bashem Yahshua. Hallelujah. As the sun sets on this installment of The Saints Through the Centuries, we are captivated by the profound impact of these extraordinary figures. These beacons of hope, resilience and faith have imparted timeless lessons. Join us next time as we continue our odyssey through time, exploring the enduring legacy of these iconic figures. And of course, our host, Michael Midwest Bannock, donned in his signature fedora, will guide us on the next captivating journey. To continue your search for truth, please visit our website, www.yrm.org. Until next time.